G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for yet another trade update. This will be my last one for a little bit. I am heading down to London very, very shortly, straight after this video actually. What I've done is pre-recorded a bunch of videos uh, ahead of time and uh, there's going to be, I think, a video every single day that I'm in London, which should be about five or six days. But in terms of the daily trade updates, frustratingly, I won't be able to do those for you because I gotta go head down to London, of course, and catch up with a lot of friends that I've neglected this summer. But filming on the couch today, I've done a bit of an injury uh, uh, I'll explain it in another video, which is weird because this video is going to come out before the video where I actually explain what I've done to myself. But anyway, I'll let you see it in real time. Um, but today we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of a trade update because there has been some juicy news today. Going to run through uh, some trade requests. There's a new team in the hunt for pick one. West Coast is involved in this one. Yeah, some more interesting news along the way. So let's start off with the fact that Tom Dode has nominated the Brisbane Lions as his preferred club of choice through free agency. Just as a side note, for anyone who's still getting their head around the you know, trade period and the draft and free agency, I have just uploaded a video explaining all these concepts to the best of my ability. So go check that out. It literally came out earlier today. So, so yeah, uh, Tom Dode, the uh, intercepting defender from the Adelaide, Crows obviously coming off an ACL uh, has formally requested or maybe not request but indicated that the Brisbane Lions are his preferred destination uh, this upcoming free agency period he is a free agent essentially this one if you haven't been keeping up was a case of Dode wanted to stay at the Adelaide Crows but coming off an ACL the contract offer he got from the Crows was a little bit underwhelming he's chasing some security I think the Pies the Swans and the Lions were all interested and Brisbane has emerged as the team that he wants to go to so this is an nice piece of business I think from the team that obviously nearly won the grand final shoring up the defense a little bit lost Marcus Adams Daniel Rich is retiring they won't see him until the back end of 2024 but uh, it is a still a good win for the Brisbane Lions and a quality player and one that I think well if I was a Crows fan I'd be a little bit annoyed that they let Tom Dode go but they've obviously set a value on what his value actually is and they were unwilling to go past that value and now he's going to end up at a different club and this will potentially open up a few doors for the Crows obviously they've been linked to potentially going hard at Clayton Oliver Chris Burgess as an aside has also just requested a trade to the Adelaide Crows and Himmelberg out Tom Dode freed off the books gives him a little bit of flexibility to attack Clayton Oliver but we'll see very interesting times what I will say as well Dode adds to this growing list of players that Brisbane have attracted to their club that are not from Queensland and this was a bit of an issue for them you know through that mid 20 teens period when they were a bit of a basket case they were bleeding players now they're actively getting players not from Queensland to their club you know Josh Dunkley last year Lockie Neal's another one uh, Tom Dode now Joe Danaher it really does speak to the destination club that Brisbane has really kind of uh, established themselves to be this last five years. In other trade request news, we know that Mabio Ochoa has now nominated the Hawthorne Football Club as his desired club. There's a little bit of interest from Adelaide and probably a few others off the top of my head. Uh, short stay at the Gold Coast Suns. He had a pretty good first season. Uh, more or less was advised by the Gold Coast Suns that he would not be getting regular opportunity. Obviously, Ben King has come back into that side. Lukosius has uh, drifted forward in recent times with relative success, I would say. So Fabio Charles looking for a new home. Hawthorne, obviously, about to lose Jacob Kaczynski to the Richmond Footy Club, you'd expect. Therefore, this was a good signing for them. Sort of helps that, uh, reinforce that key forward sort of depth. Because he was also told that he's not going to get opportunity at Gold Coast, you can expect this one to be pretty damn cheap. Another particularly uh, interesting story, at least the Eagles fans, is that Sam McClure has come out and suggested that there's a possibility someone like an Elliot Yo moves club to the Gold Coast Suns this offseason. I found this one pretty interesting but we do temper our expectations a little bit with Sam McClure he does not put a lot of stuff out there and I still don't really know you know how legitimate his mail actually is but he says that yo could still be a trade uh, option for rival clubs if an offer is suitable West Coast would consider it now, he has said that Gold Coast has shown interest which uh, intrigues me from both sides like yo's contracted for another year at West Coast he's not going to be cheap and uh, honestly I'd be surprised with Gold Coast salary cap situation you know taking on his contract let alone extend it past this year yo could probably make more money at west coast what's in it for yo he goes to a club that isn't quite a basket case right now at the gold coast suns plays under hardwick um, but again if you're chasing success is gold coast really the best club to go to they've never finished higher than 12th not trying to fire a shot because they are in a better position than west coast by a long way but if you're gonna uproot your life at 30 years old to move to the other side of the country you'd probably want to feel pretty confident that that side is going to play finals and then finally what's in it for west coast yo's contract for another year well do we need the salary cap space? I would argue we probably don't need the salary cap space when you consider all the retirements we've just had and are likely to incur over the next year or two. So it's not a salary cap issue. Um, honestly, Yo has been so uh, injury prone over the last few years. He's hardly been in the side 
keeping others out. And to be honest, even if he was, I still think he's such a good player that him in our best 22, if he's hypothetically fit, is better for our team considering, you know, we were uncompetitive this year and Yo is still a very good player. And then, you know, what else is for West Coast? You could trade him for a draft pick. I mean, honestly, does anyone really expect that uh, Gold Coast is going to offer up anything really meaningful for Elliot Yo? We could probably get more than a 30-year-old injury-prone player is worth because Gold Coast are probably going to have this oversupply of draft picks. They can just fire off a future second or something stupid for Elliot Yo. How beneficial is that to us, really? I'd probably rather roll the dice and have a couple more years of Elliot Yo in our backline slash midfield. If he plays 12 to 15 games a year, he's probably still doing something to help uh, protect the young players in that team. So, I don't know. This is a weird one. It's kind of an unreliable source. Uh, we'll see what happens. Next up, this is not a trade uh, update as such, but we have have seen that Aaron Norton has signed an eight-year deal for the Western Bulldogs. Eight years. Ridiculous. Some commentators have had a lot to say about this, particularly Kane Corns. Can I just put this tweet up uh, from Kane Corns? He says, he, he basically asks, is, is Aaron Norton worth that because Luke Bruce kicked more goals in him this year? That, that point's fine, but he, he goes on to point out his headband and say that it's stupid. Like, come on, Kane, just try and be a little bit more professional. But, you know, it's a fair suggestion to say that uh, it's a huge price to pay. You're committing a huge part of your salary cap to one player. Can I just say as well, like, these massive, enormous contracts we're seeing in the AFL now, are they really really helping clubs. Sure, the benefit is that you get some control over a player, right? What that means is that if a player's contract, you decide whether to trade them and therefore you can ask for more in a potential trade for them. But how many times have we seen over the last few years where a player is over contracted, contracted to too much money, the club has changed their direction, they want some draft picks and they end up offloading that player for a really cheap price. How are these enormous contracts actually helping clubs. That's what I want to know. This will actually take Aaron Norton to 32 years old, and he is a really good player, don't get me wrong. But I do also understand that eight years is to smooth out the contract, you know? You make it a, an even 800 a year or something like that for eight years, what's that, $6.4 million? If you try and squeeze $6.4 million or close to into five years, then you're probably going to blow out your salary cap. So I do understand the logic behind that, but I just think eight years is ludicrous and rarely ever pays off. It doesn't even guarantee that Aaron Norton's going to stay that long. But anyway, Tom Morris also interestingly said there was a number of other clubs that had nibble uh, Collingwood Geelong uh, West Coast which kind of concerns me a little bit according to that article West Coast this is on Fox Footy offered a 10 year deal that would have cost us pick one this would have had to have been a trade Aaron Norton's a good player but he's not that good uh, and the Swans offered 11 million dollars over 10 years which would have been probably the biggest or longest ever contract so yeah anyway moving on uh, we've got Joel Hamling who is unlikely to re-sign at Fremantle this would be his fourth club if he does go to the Sydney Swans where it is now expected him to go according to John Ralph I think or at least the Herald Sun he's played just six games from his past four injury riddled season of course he was uh, he was a premiership player with the Bulldogs I think he was he was at Geelong then the Bulldogs now Fremantle obviously been hit hard by the injury stick Sydney are obviously on the market for a cheap key defensive option obviously didn't quite get the Ben Mackay thing down but the Swans are you know really active at the moment you know Grundy's expected to go there James Jordan is expected to go there Paddy Dow they've had a nibble at I think James Harms they've had a nibble at and now a Joel Hamm the Joel Hamling one makes sense. If he's fit, they need key defenders. I get it. He's going to be cheap. Next, we'll talk a little bit about James Harms. I've kind of, uh, there's not so much to speculate about this because it hasn't really moved on. We know that he's linked to four clubs and he's likely out of Melbourne. However, I thought this update was a little bit interesting. Apparently, at a recent event in Melbourne on Tuesday, he hadn't officially requested a trade as of yet and uh, the D's were happy for him to go out and have a look. But he uses the phrase, it's all up in the air a little bit. I've got a little bit of a theory about this. Harms knows there's a realistic chance he's probably going to have to leave Melbourne because he's not going to crack into that Melbourne midfield. But Melbourne have basically said, look, you can go out and try and find opportunities because that's the right thing to do, the right way to treat your player. But I wonder if there's an indication from them saying, hey, a midfield spot might open up for you. Whether or not this was directly said to Harms from Melbourne, but perhaps Melbourne are sort of bracing for the possibility that there is going to be a spot for Harms if Clayton Oliver moves. I just found that interesting, but we still don't know any more about James Harms in terms of where he's going. The other news is that Devin Robertson has a uh, officially turned his back on West Coast offer and uh, decided to stay another two years with the Brisbane Lions. It's reported that Sam, by Sam Edmund that he changed his mind multiple times, which is quite funny. Edmund says that he told people in the last few days that he was leaving and then sat down for his exit interview, changed his mind back to stay. And to be honest, good for you, Dev. This would have been a tough decision. The balance of uh, playing in a successful side with a good culture at the Brisbane Lions, chance of winning a premiership soon uh, for more money and security at West Coast and probably more time on ball would have been a really tough decision. Has he made the best decision for his footy? 
Probably, to be honest. What's, what would he regret more? You know, if he stayed at the Brisbane Lions, let's say he fails to crack into the team and he falls out of the side, would he really regret not going to West Coast and forging a more solid career there? Possibly, but there's probably greater regret in going to West Coast and then seeing the Brisbane Lions win the flag the next year. So we'll see what happens. He's a young player. He played 16 games, played in the, obviously every final that Brisbane played in. I think he's made the right decision. And as a West Coast fan, I think we'll be just fine without him. And what I mean by that is the difference between us having Dev Robertson and us not having Dev Robertson. There's not a huge gap there. We'll be okay. On more positive news though for the Eagles, Matthew Flynn from GWS has officially nominated West Coast and he will join as a free agent. Uh, he will be an unrestricted free agent because he's not paid well enough to be a restricted free agent, which means that when it opens up on Friday, which is tomorrow by the time you're watching this, he should formally become a West Coast Eagle. Obviously, uh, the Eagles looking to have some support for Bailey Williams. Probably see Williams as more of a third tall forward who is second ruck and Matthew Flynn uh, will get some extended opportunity as a number one ruck, which is his motivation for playing for West Coast. Looking at his Instagram, there's a picture of him um, in New South Wales wearing an Eagles jumper as a kid, so maybe he's an Eagles fan too. Nice. Couple more stories before we finish off. Uh, Xavier Dersma's name has been raised in negotiations between particularly Essendon and Port Adelaide. Obviously, I've been talking about on this channel a little bit murky as to how Port Adelaide get all of these trades done. They're, they're targeting four or five players in this year's trade period and have no pick before 35, I think, this year. So getting that done is going to be different in terms of collateral. I said different. I meant difficult. I'm tired. I haven't had a coffee. But Dersma has a year to go on his deal. He's obviously Victorian originally, I think, from that Gippsland sort of area. That's where his younger brother's playing for, I'm pretty sure. There's going to be a squeeze at Port Adelaide, absolutely for sure. Um, Xavier Dersma is a young, talented player, former first-round draft pick. I want to say pick 18 in 2018. Probably hasn't quite hit those same heights, considering he was taken at the same time as Butters and Der uh, uh, Rosie rather, but a little bit of upside there and uh, another play that Essendon could potentially pick up. This is proving to be a monstrous trade period. It does say that other clubs have expressed interest in them, but Essendon probably the forefront. And finally, I think I saw this on Trade Radio, but the Hawthorne list manager, I want to say, I might be quoting the wrong person. Either way, someone representing Hawthorne confirmed that Hawthorne will be making a play for West Coast pick one, which is mildly interesting, particularly interesting to Eagles fans. There was a bit of an ebb and flow as to whether Hawthorne was going to be interested in pick one. They currently hold pick uh, three outright. They get pushed down to four and then potentially five. So this will be interesting to play out. They obviously think Brockman will be part of that deal, although I think Brockman's value is so little that it doesn't really help them that much. And when I say value, I mean trade value in terms of like out of contract, needs to go home for family reasons. Not saying that he doesn't have value as a player. But, you know, contemplating this, what's the best offer that Hawthorne can give West Coast? Pick three this year and a future first? Well, Hawthorne could easily jump up the ladder next year. That could be pick three and pick 12. So as it stands, I think they'll be behind the eight ball if, if other clubs like North Melbourne, Melbourne are contemplating a move for pick one. Um, I think Hawthorne are behind the eight ball there. They'll have to do something creative to get in the mix for that. West Coast have uh, basically suggested they're more likely to keep the pick. Is that posturing? Probably. It probably is. But I can't imagine Hawthorne is able to stump up a better offer than, say, Melbourne in this year's draft. Anyway, guys, that is my take on all the latest news. Uh, I'll get this video up as soon as I have finished editing it. Like I said, going to be down in London for a week, so I won't be able to do any of these updates, but I'll be watching it like a hawk, like I said. And like like I said as well, there is going to be content every day of the week uh, until I get back, I believe. So take care of yourselves and I'll see you on the other side. Cheers, guys.